Hello, Facebook viewers. I'm Cynthia Bryant, Henry Ford Health System Media Relations Team member and moderator for today's special edition of Facebook Live, a women's broadcast. We welcome you and thank you for tuning in and joining us. We have one housekeeping note, get that out of the way. Please be sure to read our disclaimer. Find it right up at the top of the thread. This February marks actually the 57th annual American Heart Month celebration, where we acknowledge that heart disease is a problem and impart information to try and educate the public about how to be healthier, how to prevent heart disease, and if you have it, how to minimize your risks. Despite all the efforts though, in recent years, we're still seeing heart disease be a leading cause of death in the United States and worldwide. As a matter of fact, for women, the big concern is that one in three women is diagnosed annually with heart disease. What can we do about it? There are some things we can actually do. There are some preventable measures that we could be taking, which we will talk about and learn a lot more about as we go through our program today. We're gonna cover a lot, so I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time doing too much introduction because the guests that are here are the keys to our information sharing today. Dr. Brittany Fuller is an interventional cardiologist with Henry Ford Health Systems, Edith and Vincent Ford Heart and Vascular Institute. Dr. Sindhu Koshi is a cardiologist at Henry Ford Macomb Hospital. And Erin Beatty is a registered dietitian nutritionist at Henry Ford Health Systems Community and Public Health Program. Thank you all for being here, first and foremost. Appreciate your sharing the time today. Thank you. Thank you, happy to be here. Thank you, yeah, my pleasure. So there are some predictions that have come about primarily due to COVID this past year, and that's while heart disease is a problem for us, it very well could become more of a problem in the next few years to come, primarily because of risk factors like not eating healthy, which many of us haven't done since 2020, um, not sleeping well, not getting the physical activity that we ordinarily would be getting because of lockdowns and things of that nature. We'll get into all of that as we move along, but just want to start with some basic heart information 101. Dr. Koshi, if you could share with us what really is the function and the role of that fist-like organ that's, you know, in, in our in our chest. Heart does a lot of work. So definitely for us cardiologists, this is the most important organ in your body. And this tiny little muscle that you were born with uh, pumps heart, pumps blood to your entire body. So definitely getting blood to your brain and all your other organ systems. And the heart itself needs blood, which is why the coronary arteries which surround the heart are important as well. The heart actually affects the entire body, pumps blood throughout the entire body as you, as you stated. So I'm gonna figure that there are a lot of things that can go wrong with the heart itself, uh, but there are a lot of things that can go wrong with the heart that also affects other things in, in the body. Could you share with us what are some of the common um, disorders, diseases affecting the heart. Um, Dr. Fuller. So I always tell patients to think of your heart as a house. You have plumbing, you have electricity, and you have just the overall structure and function of the heart. So you can have blockages or tears in the arteries that supply the heart muscle with blood flow um, that can lead to either a heart attack or a weakened heart. Um, you can have issues with the valves or the doors that separate each chamber. Um, and you can also have electrical issues uh, that can also put a lot of strain on the heart as well. How common are heart diseases, disorders? How often do we have problems with, with, with the heart? Dr. Koshi. Um, they're unfortunately very common depending on risk factors, depending on your age and some risk factors that we can't prevent, for example, our family history, there are unfortunately one in three women die of heart disease in this country. So unfortunately, very common. Are there things we could be doing a lot differently in order to prevent some of the diseases that we are experiencing? Uh, stick with you, Dr. Koshi, on that and then move to Dr. Fuller. Yeah, so fortunately, 
uh, the majority of heart disease is preventable. So like I said, there's a few things that we can't change, like getting older. Um, and of course, our family history, who we were born to and what the genetics are in the family, we can't change, but almost everything else we can change. So almost everything is prevention. So some of those things that we don't like to do, for example, exercise, which maybe have put off over the last year or eating healthy, those are things that are easily changed um, and try to make a habit of uh, not smoking, uh, watching our weight, checking blood pressure, preventing diabetes and eating healthy for that respect as well. So those are some of the risk factors that we can work on for prevention. Any um, additions to that, Dr. Fuller? Nope, I would echo every every sentiment that Dr. Koshi you know, put out there, but smoking and maintaining a healthy weight are the two big ones. Um, like she said, genetics and family history and, and age, we can't, we can't do anything about those, but quitting smoking or not starting in the first place, exercising, and maintaining a healthy weight are the two biggest, two biggest uh, players. So it sounds like we're talking about you now, Erin, when we talk about healthy weight and uh, maintaining a, a good body weight. Eating right is a, is a big component. A heart smart or heart healthy diet consists of, of what? So the first thing I think of is lots of fiber. So fiber is known for helping with gut regularity, but it's important for so much more. So fiber helps with heart health by lowering our LDL cholesterol. We know that as like the bad cholesterol. Um, it acts as a daily detoxification. It literally acts like a sponge and comes in and scrubs out the toxins from the intestinal walls. So it supports your health in that way. And it's been found to lower chronic inflammation, which we know is a huge exacerbator of heart disease and many other chronic diseases. So fiber is the first thing I think of. And fiber is only found in our whole plant foods. What I mean by that is our fruits, our vegetables, our legumes, meaning our beans, peas, and lentils, and our whole grains. So I don't like any of those things that you just mentioned, and, and I'm being I'm being sarcastic and facetious. But there are some people that kind of feel that feel that way. How do you get people to at least try some of the healthier things? That's not my not my preference. Yes, great question, and I I get this a lot from patients. So working with a qualified registered dietitian really does help because they can talk with you about your personal preferences and see what fits in on your individual basis. Uh, for starters, I highly recommend playing around with different herbs and spices. There are so many of them out there. I mean, there's garlic and onion and ginger, cumin, paprika, um, oregano, you know, basil, mint. There's so many different herbs and spices that we can use in our cooking to um, enhance and liven up our our veggies, for example. Um, and there's different ways that we can prepare foods too. There's also different ways that we can maybe sneak the foods in. Maybe if we, for example, like shred some zucchini inside a, a stir fry or throw some veggies into a pasta or pizza sauce. So uh, working with a qualified registered dietitian can really help with that. But there's so many different ways to play around with these healthy foods so that you can um, you can enjoy them. I'm going to stick here for a minute, but I'm going to bring everyone into the conversation. I'm not going to share with you share it with me just before we came on, Dr. Koshi, but I am going to, to ask what your favorites are among you ladies in terms of some healthy choices, because um, we listen to our doctors. We will emulate our doctors. So right now you're going to be our role models. Um, let's start with you, Dr. Koshi. What are what are some of your 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 go tos, and um, do you have a favorite meal of the day? Um, so I, I would say that dinner is our biggest meal of the day um, in our home, um, and I, I am like. I would say most of my patients, I don't eat like eating all the fibers and the vegetables. I tell everybody to do it, but I find it hard myself. And uh, over this last year, I have actually made a point of prepping, meal prepping and doing salads every day for lunch. So that's it for five days of the week. I eat salad and that's my fiber for the week. But in the evenings, we actually do all home cooked meals. So between me and my husband, um, we typically do Indian food for three days of the week and then two weeks, um, we'll do two days of the week, we'll do something different. Um, that may be a pasta with some vegetables for, we've got young kids, so we've got to hide the vegetable in whatever we're doing. Um, and then on the weekend we get, we get a treat night. That's kind of what we do. Sounds good. What about in your household, Dr. Fuller? 
Well, I'm an interventional cardiologist, so I don't have a lot of time to cook, and I personally don't enjoy it. So I'm going to do a plug for Blue Apron because they have, it's a meal delivery service. It's about almost $60 a, a week, but it, they actually give you enough servings to make me, you know, I can have dinner for six days of the week. And then that one other meal is the one that I choose, whatever that may be. Um, but they do have a lot of healthy options. They now even partnered with Weight Watchers. Um, so their dinner meals are often, you know, very low calorie, high fiber, lots of vegetables, and a lot of things that I wouldn't necessarily pick up from the grocery store anyway. Um, not that I go to the grocery store, but if I did, I wouldn't necessarily pick up those things anyway. So um, I do I do a lot of Blue Apron, and I like a lot of pasta. So before I started Blue Apron, I switched to spaghetti squash, um, which I think actually does have a reasonable pasta feel without all the carbs. Sounds good. We have a question actually from Mary Ann, and this is more on the flip side. We're talking about eating right. Hers is dealing with weight. If someone has a heart attack from smoking and weight, if you stop smoking and start exercising, will your heart improve? Dr. Koshik. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So Definitely the stopping smoking will prevent you from having any further heart attacks. If there's been heart muscle damage, stopping smoking and decreasing weight and finding those healthy habits like exercise and uh, diet related changes can actually help to improve that heart muscle and help to prevent further plaque from forming or lower your cholesterol and then hopefully prevent any future heart attacks. So absolutely the first thing that we tell somebody who smokes when they've had their heart attack is that's the first thing you need to do is stop smoking. Over time, as we get older, as we age, does the heart change over time, Dr. Fuller? Absolutely, especially for women. Um, we lose our estrogen when we go into that perimenopause and menopausal state. So there's a lot of hormonal changes that happen, and that actually increases your risk of having heart disease, and it actually levels out with men when you reach into that, uh, that menopausal state. Um, and then even as we age, our arteries tend to get become a little thicker, a little, um, so so your blood pressure tends to get, uh, can be elevated as we get older. So yes, there are a lot of changes that happen, but there are things that we can do like exercise and kind of conditioning our bodies um, that, that help kind of decrease our risk of having heart disease later on. We have the heart conversation like now and, and as we get older, big question would be though, when should we first start to have conversations with our doctor, whether it's with our primary care doctor um, or, or a specialist, um, talking about our heart and, and keeping it healthy? When should those conversations start, Dr. Koshi? So I, I think it, it probably depends a little bit on your risk factors. So I, I think knowing a little bit about your risk factors and your family history is very important. So for example, if you know that both or one of your parents had heart disease at a young age, had stents, bypass, or a heart attack, you probably need to be talking to your primary care doctor a lot earlier. If you have other risk factors, for example, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you've had a stroke, or have blockages in other vessels that are not your heart, um, not your heart blood vessels, then you probably need to be seeing either a cardiologist or speaking to your primary care doctor about those things also a little earlier. Is there a specific age? I probably say that by the time a woman is into her 40s, um, she needs to be having these, definitely have these conversations, but depending on risk factors, that might be 10 years earlier. Also, there's a lot of heart issues that are related to pregnancy. And so if you had any of those issues, and those should be discussed also at an earlier time. You mentioned pregnancy, Dr. Koshi. I'm going to shift over to you, Dr. Fuller. I know this is one of your um, areas of interest and passion for you. The connection between heart disease and, and pregnancy, becoming a mom. What's what's the connection? What's the link? So having a baby is a great stress test. Um, your blood pressure, you have a lot of blood pressure things that happen. Um, this is often a time where if you have early signs of heart disease, like preeclampsia, uh, gestational diabetes, or hyper gestational high blood pressure, those are all very strong risk factors. Um, those are the 25-year-old the with preeclampsia is the one that I'm seeing in the cath lab at 45 having a heart attack. Um, so having a baby, like I said, is just like having a stress test uh, So because there's a lot of different changes that happen. Um, so if you have if you have had preeclampsia, if you did have high blood pressure during pregnancy, 
even if you were in your 20s, you should be following up with your primary care doctor and maybe into your 30s, start seeing a cardiologist um, just for kind of more preventative cardiology and preventative things that you can do to hopefully prevent that heart attack that may happen in the future. Speaking of tests, um, are there screening tests, prevention tests for heart disease that we should be getting, Dr. Kochi? So kind of a difficult question because I think it all, again, depends on risk factors and um, what your risk for heart disease are. So I think in general, there is no, I know a lot of people want to know what is the age I need to get my first stress test. And there really isn't an age. If you don't have a lot of risk factors and that's maybe not even a test that you need. So I think when you're primary care doctor does your EKG annually at your physical, that's appropriate, that should be something that's done. And of course, if you have symptoms, depending on the symptoms, then we go ahead and order other tests. Uh, again, looking at risk factors like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, that will kind of determine what the next testing should be. You just mentioned some things. Are there numbers that we need to know that we should be getting when we get our annual um, exams? And we use those numbers to kind of guide um, some of the things that, that we are and aren't doing, whether it's our cholesterol numbers or some others. Um, Dr. Fuller. Yes, so you should know your blood pressure. Um, if your blood pressure is creeping up in that 130 with that top number and that bottom number over 80, that is something you need to know. That's something that you need to know early on and start working on, it, whether that be decreasing salt in your diet and exercising or even getting started on a medication to lower that. Um, your cholesterol, your total cholesterol, but also your good and bad cholesterol, um, your LDL and your HDL, and then your A1C, which is a measure for diabetes. Uh, those are the numbers that you should know just off the top of your head, or at least have, not maybe not off the top of your head, but at least write them down so that you have an idea um, going on, going forward. Those would be the three big ones. Sounds good. I'm kind of going to go back to um, the things we can control for a moment there and, and come back to you, Erin. We, we talked a bit about what people can do um, in terms of putting better food in the refrigerator and in the cabinets and so forth. But I want to talk a little bit more about that still. Um, the realities of what people have in their cabinets, in the fridge, in the freezer, what should we be removing? If, if we at all possibly can part with some things, what should really be tossed and go away? Yeah, that's a great question. I try to come from a place of what can we add in versus what do we have to subtract? Um, um, I just think that it's a little bit more fun to to view it that way, but I also want to make sure that I that I do answer your question. Um, so I guess it depends on what's in your pantry and fridge, but. Um, you know, checking things for high sodium, checking things for high saturated fat, um, that would be a good place to start for the foods that we would, we don't necessarily have to cut out of the diet completely, but we would want to uh, limit, or we call them sometimes foods as opposed to everyday foods. Um, and as far as what can we replace them with, it really, again, comes back to um, eating, eating those whole plant foods. Um, some quick, simple ones that I really like uh, would be low sodium canned beans, uh, canned legumes, um, because that way I'm getting in more fiber, some good plant protein. Um, and then the different, yeah, the, the fruits and veggies, and they do sell them. Even frozen is perfectly fine too. Or um, if it's in your budget to buy them pre-cut, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, a quick snack for me I really like would be um, some veggies and some hummus or some other sort of bean dip um, or making my own trail mix. So some nuts and seeds and some um, sprinkling in some dried fruit. Um, so, and of course, fresh fruits is just the most nutrient and dense fast food out there. Sounds good. Want to shift back over to Dr. Koshi for a moment. Um, we touched on this briefly, but we didn't really delve into it. And the word is stress and the impact that it has on heart and heart disease. How big a factor is stress, Dr. Koshi? Uh, stress is a big factor uh, that plays an important role in heart health and heart disease. So if you think about when we are stressed, like the entire year of 2020, um, when we are stressed, then we release stress hormones, which are great. If you're being chased by a lion or running from a tiger, those stress hormones do everything that you need to have done. Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, you can get away. 
But if that continues on and you have that stress going on for the entire, for months and months because of whatever is going on, then your heart rate stays up and your blood pressure stays up. Often there's some weight gain that goes along with that. And those in turn are risk factors for then heart disease. And the stress hormone itself can cause inflammation and inflammation all over your body, which can affect those heart blood vessels, which can cause coronary artery disease. And then you're seeing Dr. Fuller and you have a problem. <laughs> We don't want to see Dr. Fuller. Or <laughs> you. We love seeing Dr. Dr. Fuller, but we don't want to see Dr. Fuller. <laughs> All in context. <laughs> Stephanie has a question along these lines, and she asks, can you talk about mindfulness, and does that help your heart health, for example, doing something like meditation? Um, and I'm just going to throw this in. I think I called you as we were preparing for this, Dr. Fuller, and um, you mentioned that you had to put the Zen music on pause. Um, meditation, yoga, uh, what, what can we do to, to quiet our mind, quiet our body, and, and help our hearts? Simple, 10 minutes in the morning, because this is what I do. Um, as you can imagine, it's every, everybody's life is stressful, but 10 minutes in the morning, just sitting there by yourself, whether that be in the shower, whether that be on the side of your bed, trying to empty your mind, that goes a long way. Um, it decreases stress. It kind of gets you going for the day. So that's personally what I do every morning. I just kind of sit there and I, I try to empty my mind. And the first time you ever try to meditate, it's very hard because our minds are running a mile a minute. Um, we're thinking about what we're gonna do for the day. We're thinking about our kids. We're thinking about what we're gonna eat. We're thinking about even just driving to work and trying not to be stressed out in the car with the traffic. So just taking that little bit of time, you don't necessarily have to get into yoga because I know that's not everyone's thing, but do taking that time to just, 10 minutes a day can often do a world of good. Um, so just taking that time just to try to clear your mind, not think about anything, just focus on your breathing actually plays a huge role in decreasing your stress for sure. Dr. Koshi, would you like to add to that, please? No, I completely agree. I do a very similar thing. Um, again, I think I mentioned I've got very young kids, so my house is just noisy all the time. So I wake up earlier than everybody so I can just sit for 10 minutes. Um, and I actually journal. So I journal for 10 minutes and then kind of get started with my day. But I didn't do that actually up until this past year. And once the year got started and everything went, um, <laughs> and I found that I needed it. I needed that 10 minutes to clear my mind and get going through my day because my stress levels were also increasing. Erin, anything to add in terms of um, how you keep your stress at bay, which helps your heart? Yes. Um, I completely agree with the doctors um, with, you know, meditating um, and taking time for yourself to, to just, you know, take some deep breaths and um, get into that, um, get into that relaxation state. I also really like sending out gratitude statements. So I do this um, kind of dorky fun thing where I text loved ones something that I'm grateful for and ask for them to send something back to me in return. So for example, just this morning, I texted a good friend saying, I'm so thankful that we have mo modern technology and we have heat in our house on a uh, cold winter day. So just taking time to express uh, gratitude and just to be grateful for what we have really helps um, uplift our mood. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all for sharing some of your personal information. Um, exercise question. If someone has heart disease, does that mean they should not exercise? Automatically, it's a no-no for them. Is that true or no? Dr. Fuller. No, they should absolutely can exercise. Uh, but what I do tell all of my patients, especially those that have had a heart attack and I've put in a stint, I like to get them, get them into a cardiac rehab program that's a little bit more structured with a cardiac physical therapist because, you, you know, there's a lot of mental things that happen once you've had a heart attack. You're afraid to get out there. You're afraid to exercise. You're afraid to, to push yourself too hard. So getting into uh, an outpatient cardiac rehab program, which is just a couple a couple hours a day, a couple times a week kind of helps not only get your mint, get you mentally ready to get back into exercising, but it also kind of guides you a little bit as opposed to you just getting out there trying to do it on your own. Um, but I always encourage, even if you've had a heart attack, it's okay. You can go for walks, you can do sedentary biking. Um, I just tell, I tell them not to push themselves too hard, too fast. So my motto is if you're 
pushing your, if you're running or walking so fast where you're huffing and puffing and can't have a normal conversation, you're going too fast, slow down, and then slowly gradu gradually build yourself up to that. Sounds good. Talking a little bit more about some signs and symptoms, um, when someone actually discovers or finds out that they have a heart issue or a heart problem, what are those things that we should be paying attention to that our body is telling us, mm, something's not right here and it might be your heart? Um, Dr. Kochi. Um, so I usually, if we're talking specifically about women, uh, I always say we, we have that women's intuition and we know when something's wrong, even though we sometimes can't pinpoint it. Uh, unfortunately for women, a lot of the signs of heart disease are different than men. For men, we often see that a heart attack, for example, is you know chest pain or pressure, left arm pain, uh, cold sweat. And for women, the list is like 20 pages long of all the symptoms you could have in combination or not, in, including just jaw pain or back pain or chest pressure or just shortness of breath. And I kind of say, if you know that something's wrong or something is out of the ordinary for you, you need to be evaluated. So if you have jaw pain, but don't think that you have, you know, a tooth problem, then you should probably be evaluated. Back pain between your shoulder blades that you don't typically have need to be evaluated. Heartburn, you didn't have, I don't know, whatever food it was, you know, out take out food, Taco Bell or something the night before and weren't expecting heartburn that's out of the ordinary. That can be a sign of a heart attack in a woman. So again, follow your intuition. Uh, us women know when something is wrong, but sometimes we put on the back burner for a little bit. Have women gotten any better at all about recognizing heart attack symptoms? Because as we probably talked about previously at some point in time, it's different or can be different for women than it is for, for men. But are we recognizing it when it's happening better? Or do we still need some more education along those lines, Dr. Fuller? I think education is always uh, a good thing. I think we always, there's always room to learn. But I do think that women are getting a lot better. Um, they're not brushing off that chest pain or that just intense fatigue and shortness of breath, which are the two the two major signs for women um, where you're just, you're up and moving and then all of a sudden you're just really tired and really fatigued and you can't do the things that you did before. So I'm actually seeing more women that are coming in like that. So I think women are a lot more educated and they are coming in a lot sooner as opposed to just pushing it off saying, oh no, I'm just, I've gained a little weight. It's just stress. I think they're actually coming in a little bit sooner. Um, but we also still need to continue this education process as well um, so that we can continue to, you know, catch all of these women early on before things, you know, before there's permanent damage done. Unfortunately for us women, when we have a heart attack or some other um, heart disease issues, we don't always get the treatment that we need to get in a, in a timely fashion. Um, what's your message to women, similar to what we were just talking about with Dr. Fuller, uh, what's your message, Dr. Koshi, to, to women to not just sit and wait, but to get it, at least get it checked out when something's a little off. I think most often uh, women who don't get checked out quickly, it's always because there's just one more thing that we'd like to get done. Um, there's one more person we want to take care of. And it's not often that we're ignoring ourselves. It's just there's somebody else or something else to take care of. And I think that's the nurturing part of us. And so I remind women that if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be there to take care of somebody else. So if something is wrong, make sure that you go quickly to get things checked out. Um, our mantra in cardiology, and I, I think Dr. Fuller, Fuller will agree that is time is muscle. The longer you wait, the more muscle is damaged and your heart is just a muscle and, and we need that muscle. And so just make sure that you're going as quickly as possible to get evaluated. Again, your intuition is right. And if you think something is wrong, you need to be evaluated. We know this past year that um, no matter what problems people had, Folks didn't want to go to the ER. They didn't really want to go see their doctors. They wanted to stay as far away from the hospital as they possibly could because of COVID-19. Um, and for some people who actually had or had been diagnosed with heart conditions, had some symptoms where they probably needed to go to an ER but chose to delay care and, and not seek care. Are we seeing folks showing up in worse states now, Dr. Fuller? Yes, and unfortunately, we're, we are seeing complications. So there are some, if you don't, if there's a blockage in one of the arteries of your heart, if you don't take care of it, that's why it's a, an emergency. If you don't take care of it 
early, it can actually lead to late complications. Um, we've actually seen a lot more late complications that were few and far between in the past. Um, we've seen a lot of them, uh, a lot of them lately within the past year, um, because people just were afraid to come to the to the emergency room. But I always tell patients, yes, it COVID is is scary and COVID is real. But if you're having a true emergency, the emergency room is still a safe place. You're still unlikely to get COVID in the hospital. There's a lot of things that we, we are doing to protect our patients and to protect you. So if you are having a true emergency, the emergency department, department is still a safe place for you. Sounds good. The signs and symptoms that are a signal that we should call 911. We shouldn't even be getting in the car to drive ourselves. What are those signs and symptoms to dial those three digits, Dr. Kochi? Um, so definitely chest discomfort, chest pain, um, chest burning heaviness, shortness of breath, intense fatigue, like Dr. Fuller had mentioned, jaw pain, neck pain, back pain, shortness of breath at any time that's all of a sudden or progressing, uh, swelling, nausea, diaphoresis, which is sweating like a cold sweat that seems out of the ordinary for you. Any of those should be a 911 call. Basically, if you think there's something wrong with your heart, it should be a 911 call. We don't want you on the road driving, and we definitely don't want somebody driving you. When EMS arrives there, they can help to treat these problems before you ever get to the hospital. And often they can transmit an EKG to the emergency room so that everybody's prepared to get you treated as soon as you get there. So there isn't time being wasted. I was surprised to learn, you, you mentioned jaw pain, I think, Dr. Fuller, I think it was you, but I was surprised to learn that gum disease is a sign that your heart may not be functioning quite like it should be, a, an unhealthy heart. What are some other lesser known signs um, that point to the heart, but we don't know that that's where it's pointing? Um, so I, again, I, I think that fatigue, if you are, if you've always been, and I'm talking about where you're just, you can't really get up and you can't move, or you just are really, really fatigued. A lot of people just, especially this past year, just blow that off as, oh, I'm just too stressed. The, the world has been stressed. Um, but that intense fatigue, especially if you've always been an active person, that is usually an indication and it can be an indication that something is wrong and something is going wrong in your heart. Um, so that is what that that in addition to, you know, all of the other symptoms, but I think that intense fatigue that you just can't shake and you're just not wanting to get up, you're not wanting to get out of bed, that is usually, it can be an indication that either your heart, the pump itself is, has gotten weaker or something is going wrong that you need to get checked out. Sounds good. How important is it to really seriously manage things like um, hypertension or high blood pressure and, and diabetes? and the role that they play in, in, in heart disease. Dr. Koshi. Um, those are serious risk factors for heart disease. So keeping your blood sugar under control is very, very important. Again, diabetes basically is a 10 times higher risk for heart disease in your future. So we wanna make sure that that is well treated and high blood pressure, hypertension, we often call it the silent killer because most people don't have symptoms when they have high blood pressure. And over a long term, those can, of course, affect the heart and heart muscle along with the blood vessels of the heart. So these are numbers, like Dr. Fuller mentioned before, knowing your numbers, you need to know what your blood pressure is and you should be asking your doctor, well, what's my goal and how are we gonna get there? You need to know the same thing with your blood sugars. You know, What are my numbers and what's my goal and how am I gonna get there? You should have a plan in place. But these two, especially, and also along with hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol, uh, which is what causes the plaque in, in your arteries. Those are, again, numbers that you should know. What are my numbers and what are we going to do to get to my goal? Um, they're important players in heart disease. Thank you. What is an acceptable amount of sodium when reading labels? And this question is for you, Erin, from Deborah. Great question. Um, so there's a couple tricks that you can do. The first thing you always want to check when you're looking at a food label is the serving size because they'll be tricky. Uh, for example, let's say that it's for a can of soup and it says that the 
uh, serving size is one cup, but you're going to have two cups worth. Then everything else on there, including the sodium, you have to double, right? Because you're eating twice as much. So that's the first thing to check out is a serving size. Then when you're looking at the sodium, there's two things that, that you can do. The first thing you can do is check out the percentage. If it's 5% or lower, that means it's low in sodium. If it's 20% or higher, that means it's high in sodium. And ideally, we want sodium to be low, right? Um, the other thing you can do is you can actually compare your sodium number with your calorie number. What I mean by that is let's say that whatever you're consuming, the calories, it says 100 calories, right? That we want to make sure we ideally want the sodium to be 100 milligrams or less per serving. So again, we want that sodium number to be the same or less than the calories. That's not always going to happen and that's okay. No need to fret, but ideally that would be a great goal. Sticking with you, Erin, another um, food nutrition related question. This one from Judy. What types of fruit should diabetics eat? All of them. All fruits are great. The answer is all of them. I get this question a lot. So for fruit, and this is going to depend on, on you know, the specific person and your um, your biometrics and all of that. But in general, we want to aim for about two cups of fruit a day, whether you have diabetes or you don't. Um, one cup is about the size of your fist, so that times two would be your daily intake for fruit for the day. And uh, fresh and frozen, they're both great options, absolutely. But mm -hmm. yeah, as far as like, specific types, they're all great. They all um, have a place in the diet. Thank you. Question for Dr. Fuller and Dr. Koshi. Um, Jennifer is asking, are you starting to see more heart issues now due to COVID-19 infections? And if so, what types of heart issues, conditions are our patients presenting with? Start with you, Dr. Fuller. Um, so we have seen what's called myocarditis, which is just inflammation of the heart muscle. Um, I've actually seen, uh, I've actually taken care of a few patients that actually had a blockage um, that were otherwise healthy and otherwise young patients um, and had no no real risk factors, to be honest with you, where they just had a, a, a clot that blocked off one of their arteries uh, and caused an acute heart attack. So I actually have seen those two being the most common. Dr. Koshi, um, are you seeing more patients um, since COVID-19? Yep. Uh, similar things as Dr. Fuller, also seeing heart failure. So the heart muscle um, just getting weak from the infection. Sometimes that does recover. We're seeing fluid around the heart develop from inflammation. Um, sometimes we have seen, seen uh, COVID-19 infection, which is a viral infection. Then later on, they get a bacterial infection. The bacterial infection can affect the heart valves. So I think we're kind of seeing the whole gamut um, of heart disease but a lot of them just related to COVID-19 where these people would have been otherwise healthy. Okay. I'm looking at the time. It's like, we've been talking longer than I realized. So I'm going to have to start to wind things down just a little bit, but I, but I do just want to ask in general, um, heart attack for, for women, where are we with numbers at this point in time? Are we starting to see improvement, uh, a decrease in the number of women that are having heart attacks or no? Dr. Koshi. Um, so I think that in general, the numbers have been getting better over time. And definitely women that are older, we're seeing that there's a lot more education and a lot more prevention. And so I, I think that we are seeing a lot less women that are older um, having heart attacks, but the number seems to be increasing in younger women. Um, and some of that may be just that uh, we don't expect as younger women to have heart disease so early, but I think those numbers are starting to climb a little bit. Um, and maybe Dr. Fuller can kind of talk about that as well because she probably sees them more often than I do. <laughs> yes, Dr. Fuller, would you uh, pick up on that, please? Yeah. What, do you, what do you see? So unfortunately, we are seeing a lot of women that have heart disease, but it's, a, it's in a different fashion. So there's different blockages that you can have. Um, and I usually tell my patients, I don't, I guess I'm aging myself, Red Fox, where he would cr clutch his chest and, oh, I'm having a heart attack. So it's we're not seeing that in young women. We're not, we are we, you can have a blockage where there's a clot that blocks up the artery, but we're seeing more small tears in the artery or just small blood vessels that are diseased, um, and those we just typically treat with medication. And we're we're trying to educate 
women more that this may be the type of pain and that may be the type of thing that they're having. And the treatment is a lot different. Uh, whereas the, if there's a blockage from a clot, I put a stent. But if there's blockages in the smaller arteries that are just too small that, that are actually within the heart muscle, that, that's more quitting smoking, exercising, diet, all of those modifiable risk factors that we've, we've been talking about this time. So it's interesting that you mentioned um, something I think people don't always think about. It used to be that it was heart disease was thought of as a man's disease. Not true. We've figured that out, which is why we're talking about women today in large part. And do understand any men who are feeling left out. Everything that we're talking about today, except for maybe the pregnancy part, does apply to you as, as well in terms of prevention. Um, but younger people um, are... You mentioned seeing more younger people, Dr. Koshi. Is is there an age shift? Um, is it just a older person's disease, or we thought it was among the elderly? Seems that that's not not the case anymore in terms of the demographic who's affected by heart disease these days, Dr. Koshi. Yeah, I, 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 I tend to agree, agree with that. Um, that uh, I think for most people, we expected that you know uh, heart attacks were occurring in the elderly and the elderly man or the men. I mean, for example, we call one of the blood vessels still so often is termed the widow maker because it's a man's disease. Um, but we are seeing a lot of these younger women, and so I've kind of used, you know, I usually tell my patients if you have a heart, you're at risk for heart disease. It doesn't matter what age. Heart disease does not discriminate. It affects everybody, no matter what color you are. It doesn't matter, you know, your family history, et cetera. Um, and it doesn't matter, you know, what, what other things that you're doing, but it can affect anybody at any age. And so prevention needs to start from the very beginning. So important for um, telling, teaching your children prevention so that these are habits that are formed, you know, throughout your, their life. And so I do think that we're seeing a lot of younger women. I wonder if it's a little bit more stress Lately, um, or even in the last few years, you know, there's there's the working mom population. There's so many things to do, and maybe there's just more stress, and that could be adding to some of the the younger women. And of course, when we see younger women, I think a lot of them can't believe that it could happen to them, and they may not have the same education as older women may have because they may not be going to the doctor as often because they're healthy. And so I think that education like this is important because everybody needs to hear it that you're at risk for heart disease. Sounds fair enough. Thank you, Dr. Koshi. Well, Valentine's Day, going to shift gears here for just a moment, is right around the corner. And after this past year, I think most of you would agree with me that we all deserve a treat, a sweet treat. <laughs> I'm going to ask you what your heart healthy, sweet treat suggestions, recommendations are for each of us and, and for our viewers as well. I'll start with the person who's going to try to probably make us eat healthy. I'm going to start with Erin. What Valentine's treat should we try? Yes. So I have a couple, a couple ideas. So the first idea is taking the road of finding a recipe that does use um, more nutrient dense ingredients. What I mean by that is, for example, using fresh or frozen fruits for sweetness. So this past holiday season, um, I actually made a batch of cupcakes that were made entirely from fruits, oatmeal, peanut butter, and cocoa powder, and gave them out to, to loved ones, just did some COVID-friendly uh, drop-offs, porch drop-offs. No one knew. They all just thought they were delicious. So there are tons of great recipes out there. My other idea is if you have a particular dessert that you know is not the healthiest, but you want to eat it this holiday, go for it and enjoy it. And I truly mean that. Eat it, enjoy it. No need to beat yourself up. Just enjoy it. It's delicious, indulge, and then pick back up with eating those nutrient dense foods with the next meal. But yeah, no need to fret. Just enjoy it. We deserve it, right? <laughs> right. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Fuller, what's your recommendation? What's your, what's your favorite? What's your go-to? Oh, I have so many go-tos. Um, but if we're speaking heart healthy, strawberries dipped in dark chocolate. Dark chocolate has some antioxidants and some uh, some positive health benefits. So that would be my go-to. Okay. 
And Dr. Koshi, I'm not leaving you out of this one. What's your recommendation for us? Well, I was going to say the same thing. The strawberries <laughs> dipped in chocolate were perfect because uh, if I'm going to do dessert, it's not going to be heart healthy. <laughs> I go with Aaron and I say I'm going to indulge and I'm going to have a little tiramisu on Valentine's Day. Sounds good. <laughs> so we're going to do one serious last fill in for, for viewers. Um, the one thing that you want people to know and to remember, women in particular, Dr. Fuller, what's that one key message that you want us to, to keep with us and live by? Uh, I would say if you're, again, like Dr. Koshi said, I'm going to steal hers uh, for a second. Trust your intuition. If you know something's wrong, if you know you don't feel well, if you know you're tired, fatigue, that is out of proportion to what you have ever felt, seek help. Okay. And uh, Dr. Koshi, what's your final message for viewers today? I think for uh, men and women, uh, but especially for women, make sure to take time out for yourself. It is important to care for yourself and it's not indulgent to take care of yourself as well, because that's the only way you're going to be able to take care of everybody else around you. Okay. And you get the last word, Erin. So I'm going to agree with the idea of self-care, self-compassion. I'm a little biased. Of course, I'm going to say that part of self-care is, is eating well. And so a great trick for me, eat the rainbow. I would love for people to remember the term eat the rainbow. What I mean by that is actually going through the rainbow in your head and eating all of the, the beautiful colors of the rainbow, because that way you're getting different vitamins and minerals and powerful antioxidants to support your health, um, both your heart health and just your overall health. Um, and, um, and enjoy it, play around with different recipes and just enjoy it. Sounds good. So you can find out about your heart. We have an online heart assessment. And you can also learn about cardiology services as well by simply going to henryford.com slash heart. Don't forget, mask up, socially distance, wash your hands, and when you can, get vaccinated. Be safe.